the absolutely special privilege to have Rabbi Fran for the past several years does not in any way diminish the absolute gratitude that we have for having Rabbi Fran at this busiest time of his year come to San Diego and inspire us before Rosh Hashanah. So very special thank you to Rabbi Fran and to all of those who made this morning possible. I'm going to make sure everything runs on time, so I'm going to leave my remarks that brief. And now I introduce you, uh, and a very special thank you to our co-chairs, Adam and Marina Stragovich, and Sam and Marin Ellis. Uh, hi, I'm Adam Stragovich. Thank you uh, so much for coming. Um, I think in one of the cards that was passed around, uh, it didn't have uh, Marin and Sam Ellis's name. And so I'm sorry for that oversight. I do want to say that in, a, uh, in any communal endeavor, there's always someone in the background who's like, you can do it. It's, it's okay. We'll figure it out. Uh, and that's the role of, uh, of Marin and Sam Ellis. And uh, so certainly very appreciative of, uh, of all their help. Um, I think about, you know, this time of year we have a lot to answer for, but we also have a lot to be grateful for. And the tremendous amount of community support, uh, people whose children have already graduated from Torah High, uh, people who uh, only have boys, uh, people whose children are still several years away from it, uh, recognize what an amazing uh, school it is. Um, you know, I, I also have my name first, uh, really, as an accident of the alphabet. Uh, my wife is, uh, I think, as, as anybody knows, uh, incredibly involved. Uh, my grandmother used to say, if you want something done, you should ask a busy person. Uh, and in addition to having a full-time job, she also does the medical billing for her uh, father. It's probably 150 patients a day, uh, in addition to many, many other things. So the amount uh, of work that's gone into it, I uh, can just say um, thanks for that. Uh, and as we think about what we're grateful for, uh, we're certainly grateful for uh, the shul, uh, Adat Yishurun, uh, the Rebetzin, and, and Rabbi Wogelartner's support uh, over the years of the school, the, the constant support. Um, and uh, I should also mention that uh, for those who don't know, who are either new to the community, visiting, haven't been in that part of the community, uh, we do have Rabbi Pikus uh, in our community who's just really extraordinary. I, I, as one of my volunteer things, work in college admissions for my college in the East Coast. And I've tried to figure out why uh, the, the success of the girls from Torah High is so high, why it's such a desirable uh, school for seminaries and, and colleges. And a lot of the answer comes back that there's a really strong integrated curriculum and that gigantic academic uh, administrative staff that they have uh, at Torah High really has everything together. Um, the academic administrative staff, I think, is just Rabbi Pika. So don't tell that there aren't 15 people. Uh, obviously, there's, there's office administrative staff, but academics, I think it's just Rabbi Pikas. So the world out there thinks that all of the, the productivity is, is the result of, you know, 10 or 12 people, uh, and it's really just Rabbi Pikas. So that's a, a testament to, to how fortunate uh, we are. So um, certainly very lucky, of course, in our community to have uh, Rabbi and Rabbi Wogelentner, and I guess this is a sort of gratitude squared uh, to the fact that we have his Rebbe uh, here uh, to be with us before Rosh Hashanah. So, um, just want to say thank you very much for uh, helping to organize that uh, to Rabbi Pikus and uh, really a, a list that's too long uh, to go through everybody to thank. So thank you very much for coming and for all your support of a, a very worthy cause. This is always one of my uh, thrilling moments of the year to have the opportunity to be able to um, welcome my Rebbe, and to be the one who gets to um, introduce Rebbe to, uh, to the community. They say over that there was a Rav who once stood in front of his community and he was giving a drasha, and um, it was Yom Kippur, it's the Kol Nidre drasha, and he gave an unbelievable, emotional, exciting, uplifting drasha, and everybody in the community was very moved. There was one person that was sitting like this, arms folded, half falling asleep. Okay, so the Rav figured, listen, you know, you can't touch everybody. He gets up, Yom Kippur morning, 
and he gives a yiska drasha like no other. And it is inspiring and uplifting, and people are crying, mamish, real tears. And this guy is just sitting there with his hands folded, gets to Ni'ila, and the Rav stands up and with all of his kayach, and with all of his creativity, gives a drasha that brings everybody up into the heavens, and they soar through Ni'ila. And this guy's just sitting the whole time, not moved, hands folded. The Rav goes over to him after Yontif, and he says to him, you know, I don't get it. I see everybody's, everybody's so moved. Everybody enjoyed the drasha. Everybody was able to use it and to find something in it and to, to, to move along with it. What was the matter with you? The guy looks at me and goes, I'm not a member. A lot of times when a speaker speaks to us, they speak here, and we have to figure out some kind of way to make that understandable and applicable to our own lives. But very often, we have the opportunity to hear someone who speaks dvarim ayotzim in alev, words that come from the heart and that are nichnasim al alev. And that if our ears are open, so then those words will enter automatically into our hearts. No matter if we fold our arms and we try to put up armor and we try to become defensive, if we listen carefully, the words that we hear are words that will enter right into our hearts and uplift us and focus us for the upcoming Yom in Noraim. It is an incredible zechus, an incredible honor for our community to be able to once again welcome a Rav Yisachar friend and to have him share with us some divrei hisoras, some words of awakening and uplifting words before the Yom Naraim. Thank you very much, Rabbi Jeff. First of all, Bershus de Mordasa, Rabbi Ugalanter, the other Rabbanim, Rabbi Pikus, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a, a special nachas and joy to come to La Jolla and to see what Rabbi Ugalanter has accomplished here. I don't know if he remembers this, but I, and I certainly don't remember every conversation that I had with every student, but I distinctly remember a conversation that I had with Rabbi Wogelanter, who is still a single, learning in my shir in the yeshiva, it was Eric and Kipper. He was in my car. We sat in front of my apartment, and he discussed a problem which he was which he was having. It was a typical problem of a, of a single bocher in yeshiva. And now to think, I must be 40 years later, the type of issues that he has to deal with, and the type of burden that he carries in order to service this community, how far he has grown from being a single individual worried about something which at the time was perhaps just trivial to now carrying the weight of an entire community on his shoulders together with his wife, Shashi. So it is particularly a nachas for me uh, who shared in part of his education that he has grown to such an extent and now has the not the weight of the world on him, but the weight of the La Jolla Jewish community on his shoulders. It is always a pleasure to deal with Rabbi Pikus, and he does not let any detail go unnoticed. I will just read to you very briefly the schedule that Rabbi Pikus sent me for this morning. 7.15 a.m., pick up Rabbi Friend in Los Angeles. 9.15 a.m., arrived San Diego at Rabbi Wogerlander's house, Rabbi Fran's luggage transferred to Rabbi Wogerlander's car. 9.40 a.m., travel to Adat Yeshurun with Rabbi Wogerlander. 9.50, introduction. 9.55, Chuvat Russia. You're five minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> 11 a.m., Rabbi Fran leaves for airport with Rabbi Wogerlander. 12.40 p.m., United Airlines flight 1590 to Washington, D.C., 8.34 p.m., Premier Sedan meets Rabbi Fran at luggage. He missed his calling. He should have been in the military. 
But that's the way he, he runs things and every conceivable detail and need that I could possibly need, he's taken care of. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to deal with such a person and he should have Hatzlocha together with his wife and the school and his children and should have Nachas and Aksiv Aksiv Ataiva. One of the dominant themes of the entire prayers and tefillahs of the Yom and Eroim, the days of Oz, is that we will not win this case of ours on the basis of merit. We have to realize and perhaps as opposed to previous generations when there was an awe going into these days and they are in fact called the Yom and Eroim, the days of Oz, because people were literally afraid. And that's because what we are approaching over here is called the Yom Adin, the day of judgment. Judgment is not touchy-feely. Uh, judgment is not, uh, you know, will make nice. Judgment is du judgment. We're on trial for our lives, for our health, for our families. And that is why the prayers are replete with, with, a, with, with all sorts of uh, uh, con connections with Yom Hadin. In the Nisana Teikif, which is perhaps the most moving and haunting tefillah of the Yom Neiroim, we say the words, Ki lo yizku be'enecha badin. No one will, meet, will win this case on the basis of his merits. No one can sit, come into this din and say, listen, I've been such a good person the entire year. This is going to be a cakewalk. This is a slam dunk. I'm out of here, not guilty. It's not like that. In the tefillah of Erev Rosh Hashanah, we'll say, al tavoy b'mishpati manu, God, don't judge us with strict justice. Ki lo yitztak lefanecha kol because no human being will ever get out of this based on his merits. As righteous as we may seem, as religious as we may be, as good a person as we, we may be, but we're all lacking. We all have our foibles and we all have our pitfalls and we all have the things that we know we shouldn't have done. And therefore the question becomes, the serious question, is how indeed will we walk out of this period of judgment and win our cases? So the sages have not left us without suggestions. And one of the suggestions of how in fact we can win our cases, even though we may not be worthy, is what the Gemara tells us in the Sechta Shabbos in the Talmud. Kol ha-merachem ha-labriyais merachen in olav min ha-shamayim. That if you have compassion and sympathy and mercy and empathy for another person, that will how be how God judges you as well. It's a very simple formula. You show compassion and empathy and sympathy to others, that's how God will deal with you. And therefore, even though you may not be righteous in terms of the strict justice, but God will have rachmanus. God will have mercy. And he'll give us, give you a good year. I'm sure that many of you have heard of Rabbi Leib Steinman, who's perhaps the, perhaps the, the God of Hador, the leader of generation, a man who is into his hundreds, a man who is a, by all accounts, not only a great scholar, but, but, but a tzaddik, a righteous person, lives in a small little apartment, sits on a little chair, which the chair is backed up against a couch. That's how he lives. Lives literally like a pauper, even though there would be people that would be waiting in line to build this man a decent home. But this is a person that people come to him from all over the world. And they go ahead and they pour out their tzaras to him and their troubles. And they ask him, what should we do? What mitzvah should we work on? What character trait should we do? In order that that should be a schus and a merit for us, for God to, to, to change our fate. And Reb Steinman invariably tells them, there's one thing you should do. Be compassionate and merciful and kind to other people. Because mercy begets mercy. And Rachmanus begets Rachmanus. And if that's the way you act with people, that's the way God will act with you as well. So that is what I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm going to talk about 
empathy, not sympathy, empathy. Empathy, empathizing with other people's problems. And there's a concept that's used in the Talmud that connotes this concept, and it's called Naisei Ba'el and Chaveirai, which literally means carrying the burden together with your friend. A person has a burden, a person has tsaras, a person is carrying an oil, he's carrying a yoke. Naisei Ba'el and Chaveirai means I share in that burden. And what I'm going to demonstrate today, I hope, that even if a person will be at the lowest of the low, a person will be what is a bona fide Russia, an evil person. But if a person demonstrates this capacity to share the burden and to share the pain, God treats him in an extraordinary fashion. And no matter how low a person may have sunk, if you act like this, this is your ticket. Because rachamim and empathy begets, begets empathy from God. So here's my case. There are two people who are in Tanakh that by all accounts will be considered Rishoyim, evil people. These two people tormented Moshe Rabbeinu from the beginning of the book of Exodus all the way into the middle of the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. They made Moshe's life miserable. <laughs> they were all, by all accounts, evil, terrible people. Who are these two people? Dosan Aviram. Now here's a brief history or a list of particulars. And if I was a prosecuting attorney, this is how my indictment would read. Number one, when Moshe Rabbeinu saved the Jew who was being beaten up by the Egyptian, they went and slandered Moshe Rabbeinu to Paro, and Moshe became a fugitive of justice and had to run away because Paro was out to get him. Number two, when Moshe went into Paro, and pleaded on behalf of the Jewish people that Paro, that Pharaoh should lighten the load of the Jewish people, that they shouldn't have to make so many bricks and build so many periods, pyramids. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes into Paro together with Aaron, and rather than being successful, the situation deteriorates and it gets worse. And rather than just demanding a quota of bricks, they all have to now get the straw as well. Moshe Rabbeinu comes out of Paro, and they're accosted by two people who yell at them and say, what have you done to us? And in fact, they use the terminology, Asher hivashtem es reichenu, which literally translated as, you have made us smell, but figuratively means you have ruined our reputation. It was better beforehand. Look what you've done. You've made matters only worse. Who were those two people that accosted Meshe Rabbeinu? Dosan Vaviram. Number three, when Moshe Rabbeinu tells the people that manna is going to come down from heaven every single day and you're going to get a portion, every day you're going to get your own portion, but don't leave over for the next day and don't try testing God on this. Who are the two people that don't believe that and try to save over for the next day? Dosan Vaviram. Number four, when in the middle of Sefer Babibar, the book of Numbers, Korach challenges the leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Korach may have at least had a legitimate case of why he felt that he should also be part of the leadership. But Dosan Vavirim had no dog in this fight. But who jumped into the fray and nevertheless challenged Moshe Rabbeinu? Our friends Dosan Vavirim. That's quite a rap sheet in my book. But it doesn't end there. Because listen to the following Pasuk. When Paro had second thoughts after he sent out the Jewish people, and he had what we can call emancipator's remorse, the Pasuk says, And Paro says to the children of Israel, Look, they're gone, they're lost. Those words, And Paro tells the people of Israel, What people of Israel? They had gone. They had left. This is post Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. This is after they had left Egypt. So what does it mean? He tells B'nai Yisrael, Vayova Amar Paro Livnei Yisrael. So Rashi, bothered by this, says, we cannot translate the words literally, and Livnei Yisrael doesn't mean to the children of Israel, it means concerning the children of Israel. 
but the Targum Yonason ben Uziel, one of the classic commentaries on the Bible, writes and says, no, it means literally. These two Bnei Yisrael, you know who they are? Good old Dosen Vaviram, the Mishtairin B'Mitzrayim. Because all the Jews left, but Dosen Vaviram said, nah, it's too good here in Egypt, we're sticking around. And therefore, Omar Paro Levnei Yisrael means literally, Paro spoke to the children of Israel. Which children of Israel? Dosen Vaviram. Which leads us to the following problem. Because we know what happened to any Jew that didn't want to leave Egypt. Jews that didn't want to leave Egypt and said the life here is too good, they all perished during the Makkah of Choshech, during the ninth Makkah of darkness. And in fact, the sages tell us that only 20% of the Jews actually left Egypt because the 80% that didn't want to leave died. So if Dos and Varvirim didn't want to leave, and they should have died in Makas Choshech. So what does it mean they're still around? Vomar Paro Levnei Yisrael. So one of the great rabbis of the previous generation, the Maharil Diskin, who was the rabbi in a town in Lithuania or Poland called Brisk, and subsequently Rishalayim, says an amazing thing. Yes, Dos and Varvirim didn't want to leave Egypt. And truth be told, they should have taka died during the Makas Chayshek like all the other people. But they had a schus, they had a merit. They had a mitzvah that saved them. And you know what that mitzvah was? Because the Egyptians had a system of how to get the Jews into work. There were the Egyptians' overlords, the overseers. But they didn't do the actual enforcement. Who did the actual enforcement? They had Jews do the enforcement of beating the other Jews to get them to work, a la the kapos that existed in the concentration camps. Dos and Vavirim were those kapos. Dos and Vavirim were those taskmasters. But rather than beating their fellow Jews, they got beat themselves. They took it on their backs. And in fact, the Medrash says that that aforementioned Pasuk, which literally meant you made a smell, and which we translated figuratively, you wound our reputation, the Medrash says it means literal. We smelled, you know how we smelled? Because we had open wounds on our back. And eventually those open wounds began to putrefy. Because Dosan Vaviram got beaten rather than beat another Jew. To which the Maharal Diskin says, a Jew who suffers on behalf of another Jew gets an incredible reward from the Rebani Shalom from God Almighty. And a person can be as a low life as Dosen Vaviram, but he has that schus. He cares about another Jew. He suffers beyond another Jew to the extent he gets beaten by another Jew. So God treats you totally differently. You can be a terrible person, but you have that schus, you have that merit, you have that mitzvah. God says, I treat you differently. And therefore the other Jews who didn't want to leave Egypt may have died during the Makas Choshech, during the darkness, but not Dosem Vaviram. They survived. And that's Vomar Paro Livnei Yisrael, Power of speaking to Dosen Vavir and the Mishtairin be Mitzrayim, who were left over in Egypt in spite of the fact they didn't want to go, because they had this incredible schus. But that leaves us with one last question. If they stayed in Egypt and they refused to go, and now they're standing with Paro on the banks of the, of the sea, how did they cross the sea? How did they join the, the, the Jews? Remember, there was Kriyas Yamsuf, there was this Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea that God split for the entire Jewish nation. But they didn't participate. They were there on the banks. They were together with Paro. But we know that they eventually joined the Jewish people, so how did they get there? So the Maril Diskin says an incredible thing, and he says this says so in the Medrash. 
and that is that God made a personal Kriyas Yamsuf, and he split the sea for these two guys, Dos and Vavira. This great nace that we always look at the paradigm of all miracles, the splitting of the sea on behalf of the people of Israel. There are two fellows that they had their own, their own personal Kriyas Yamsuf. Dos and Vaviram. Incredible. These terrible people, tormentors of Mesh Rabbeinu. And yet God saves them and lets everybody else who didn't want to go die. And then God turns around and says, Guess what? You guys get your own Kriyas Yamsuf. Why? Because they had a schus. Because they had a merit. Because they had a mitzvah. And that mitzvah is caring about another Jew, warring about another Jew, suffering on behalf of another Jew. And with this, we can say an incredible insight into a posik that you said this morning and that you'll say every morning. It's a posik in Oz Yashir. What's that posik? Now think about that posik. Listen to this posik. Ki vasus paro birichbo uforashov bayam. Because paro and his nation and his chariots came into the sea. Vayashav Hashem alehem esmei hayam. And then God returned the sea over the Egyptians and they all drowned. Ubenei Yisrael halchu bayabasha besoch hayam, and then Bnei Yisrael went into the dry land, dry sea besoch hayam. That pasuk is inverted; it's chronologically incorrect. How did it happen? First, the Jews crossed the sea in dry land because God split the sea. Then Paro jumped in with the rest of his army, and they were drowned. That's not what the pasuk says. The pasuk says kibosus Paro birachva. Paro comes into the sea, and God goes ahead and returns the sea on top of them. That happened before, not after. Says the Maril Disk in the Bear Mayim Chaim, you know who B'nai Yisrael is referring to? Dosan Vaviram. They're their own Kriyas Yamsuf. These Rishayim. That's the merit of feeling for the pain of another Jew and suffering for another Jew and carrying the burden of another Jew. And if you ask me, out of all the mitzvahs there are in the Torah, why this? Why does God reward a person in such extraordinary fashion and I think the answer to that is that if one can say about God Almighty that he has a signature characteristic, it is this very characteristic that he cares for his people and he's there with their pain. Because the first time God introduced himself to the people of Israel, this is my Shalom Aleichem, this is who I am, I'm going to be with you now for the rest of history. But who am I? So how does God introduce himself to the Jewish people? He comes to the burning bush, and he appears in a burning bush. Rashi comments, why a bush? Why not a fir tree? Why not an oak tree? Why not a cedar tree? Why not a willow tree? But a bush. Says Rashi, because imoy anoichi b'tzara. Because I'm with you. You're low and so am I. I may be God Almighty, but when you suffer, I suffer. That's his calling card. That's who he is. And when we emulate that, and we act like that, God says, I love such people. And that's why he goes and he treats us and Vaviram like no other two individuals. I could stand here literally for the rest of the morning and tell you over stories 
about how people, great people, and not such great people, not such famous people, how they practice this concept of Naisei Ba'olem Chaveri. I'm sure many of you have heard the name of Rav Aaron Kotler, Zechut Tzadik Levrocha, who founded the Lakewood Yeshiva, which is the biggest yeshiva in the world today. During World War II, his wife, Rebetzin Kotler, refused to have sugar in her tea because if the Jews in, in Europe are suffering, I'm going to deny myself that pleasure. When Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, the patriarch of the famous Soloveitchik family, there was a fire in the city of Brisk in which he was the rabbi, and many people were homeless. Reb Chaim Soloveitchik refused to sleep in his bed at night because if people are homeless and they don't have a bed, I'm not going to sleep in a comfortable either. And he slept in the shul on a bench. During the first girl Gulf War, when scuds were flying on Israel, Rav Eliezer Shach, the head of the famous Ponev Chishiv in Eretz Yisrael, slept in a fashion in which his head was on the side of the bed. And invariably, in the course of the night, his head would fall off the bed, which would awaken him, preventing him from getting a, a, a solid night's sleep. He was an old man by then. His Talmudim, his students came to him and said, why are you sleeping like that? You're an old man, you need your sleep. He says, you know why? Because when American boys came to me and they said that their parents want them to come home from Israel because they're afraid that they'll be killed by the scuds. And I told these boys that if they learn and they study terror in Israel, I take the responsibility and they won't be killed. He says, because of me, parents are not sleeping a good night's sleep in America. And if parents aren't sleeping a good night's sleep, I'm not going to sleep a good night's sleep. That's nice Baalam Khaveri. When Rabaran Kotler Zechitzadik Livrocho was sick on his deathbed, suffering from the incredible pains of cancer, Ahmad Litzlan. So he was afraid that he had forgotten how to say Shmein Asrei. If you can imagine that, the man that knew Shas like his fingertips, the entire Talmud, but was afraid that he couldn't remember the words of Shmein Asrei. So we would have a boy stand next to him who would say the Shemona Esrei word by word and Rabbi Aaron Kotler would repeat after him, Baruch, Baruch, Ato, Ato, etc. And they got to the bracha of Rufa'enu when we asked for to help people who are sick to get better. So he's saying the bracha of Rufa'enu, but we know that if you have people, you know people who are sick, you can insert in that bracha the names of the people that are sick. And all of a sudden, this man that may have forgotten Shemin Esrei, but when he gets to that bracha, he starts shooting out of his mouth all the different people for who he's davening for. Here he's sick on his deathbed, in pain, in excruciating pain. His memory has failed him. He may not remember Shemin Esrei, but he remembers all the people that he's davening for that they should get better. That's what's called Naisib Alam Chaveirei. That's what's called sharing the burden. That's what's called empathy. That's what's called compassion. But in these last two weeks, we saw that you don't have to be Rabbi Aaron Kotler or Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik or Rabbi Shach to feel like that. Because in these last two weeks, since the beginning of Hurricane Harvey and through Hurricane Irma, we have seen Klal Yisrael, the Jewish people, act in such an amazing and incredible fashion to be nice and chaveiroi. To share the burden with the people in Houston and the people in Miami and the people in Florida. Sharing the burden both in terms of money and in terms of supplies and in terms of hard work. I asked the president of the OU who ran a campaign to raise money for the Jews of Houston. And I asked them, as it was two Fridays ago, how much money have you raised? $1.2 million. The people of Dallas, Texas, supplied 4,000 Shabbos meals, that first Shabbos after Hurricane Harvey. I spoke to a head of the Kolel in Houston, and he told me 
that, he's, that they're now serving. They live in a neighborhood that wasn't affected. They're serving 2,000 meals. They were serving 2,000 meals a day. And the hundreds of people, the hundreds of people who came down from all over the United States to do back-breaking work, schlepping out dirty, smelly, soaking carpets. And that includes your, your own Rabbi Logo Lantern together with a group of people that they went down to schlep, to work like a ferret, if you know what that means. And he told me just this morning that they knocked on the door of a woman who's a widow and whose house is ruined. And she told them, don't help me, but there's a woman across the street who has three children who has a broken leg. Help her. Or there's another woman, another woman who's 90 years old. You've got to help her before you help me. That is called Naisei Boilem Chaveiroi. And when Hurricane Irma hit Miami and people didn't have to wear to go be for Shabbos, the community of Atlanta, Georgia hosted a thousand people for Shabbos. Now, Atlanta is a small, it's a, it's a nice community, but it's not, it's not New York, it's not L.A. It's a small community. Imagine having a thousand people all of a sudden show up for Shabbos. A chesed organization in, in New York called Chazde Lave sent down $100,000 worth of food. That's called Naisibol Mechaveiroi. And these aren't Aaron Cutlers or Menachem Shachs. These are regular old people. Not so regular. That's nice, Sibel Mechaveri. I can't begin to imagine that as we approach the Yomim Noroim, the days of awe, that God does not look down on his people and say, Mi Kamcha Yisrael, who are like my people? Look at my children. Look how they act. What an incredible schus it is for Klal Yisrael. Now, some of that of supplying money and food is not necessarily unique to the Jewish people and the secular world acts like that as well. But here's something that is uniquely Jewish. A fellow walks into a shul in Israel, into Jerusalem, for Minyan, and he sees that the people are saying to heal him passionately. And he doesn't know what's going on. Was there a terrorist attack? What's happening? And he asks, is an Israeli? Makara, what happened? And this is what the Israeli tells him, Vizela Shono, this is his words verbatim. Biglal Shigesh, tsunami be Texas. Because there's a tsunami in Texas. And then he says, Anilo Yadea Mazet tsunami. I don't know what the word tsunami means. Vanilo Yadea Mazet Texas. And I don't know what Texas either is either. Aval Yehudi Batsara. But there's a Jew in pain. That is quintessentially Jewish. That's Neisibel and Chavere. That's empathy. And that's how we are going to emerge successful from this Yomim Neiroyim. But all of this leads us to two questions. Number one, how does it work? How does my symbolic depriving myself of a pleasure, how does that do anything for you? How does not having sugar in my tea help you in your time at Zorah? And number two, more fundamentally, how do we become more empathetic people? So I think the answer to the first question is how does symbolic suffering or symbolic hishtatfus and sharing the burden, how does that help? I think it helps at two, on two levels. Number one, because if you're suffering and you know that I'm trying to suffer with you and bear some of your pain, albeit not the same level at all, but you know you're not alone. And when a person knows he's not alone, it's a great comfort. 
And when a person feels totally alone and nobody cares, it's devastating. You know, I'm sure you've heard of Job and the terrible suffering that God visited upon him as a test. And when the Satan came to God and said, let me test Eov, see if he's such a tzaddik after all. So God says, okay, you can do whatever you want to Eov. And he took away his wife and his wife died. And then he took away his children and his children died. And then he took away his parnasa and his, and his holdings died. And he was destitute. And then he went ahead and he brought on him physical pain, Yisurei Eov. But God made one condition with the Satan. You can't kill him. You can bring pain on him, you can torture him, but whatever you do, you can't let him die. So what did the Sutton do to make sure that Eev would survive? He left him with three friends. And when Eev was going through this, his three friends came to be with him and to talk to him and to try to comfort him and try to explain to him. And that's why Eev survived, because he wasn't alone. But even if the person does not know that you're not putting sugar in your tea, but I'm suffering somewhat on your behalf, it also helps. And that is because the Pasik tells us, which we'll lay in next week's parsha, Hatsur Tomim Pa'olai, that God's justice is perfect. It's exquisite. And God does not make a person suffer more than a minute that God deems that he has to for whatever reason. And no one has to suffer beyond an iota more than what God deems to be perfect justice. But if a person is suffering, and as a result of that, I'm suffering as well, and the family's suffering as well, and the friends are suffering as well, and the rabbis are suffering as well, then God says, that's not what I bargained for. And that's not what I wanted. So the more the people suffer, the more says God, listen, this is not what I wanted. I have a friend who's not a chassid, who's 30 years ago, his mother was ill, and he was in the Catskill Mountains for the summer, and there was a very famous Rebbe who's already not longer living in this world called the Spinka Rebbe. And he went over to the Spinker Reb and he says, my mother is not well, can you daven for her? And he said, yes, I can. A year later, he was in the mountains again and so was the Spinker Rebbe. And he goes over to him this time and the Spinker Rebbe looks at him and says, how's your mother? This is not a Spinker Chosid. This is a man that the Spinker Rebbe met once. How many people do you think came to the Spinker Reb in the course of a year and said, could you daven for my mother, my father, my whatever? And he remembers. Because he's a Rebbe. Because he's a holy person. Because it bothered him. And if it bothers enough people, God says, that's too many people suffering. And therefore this person will suffer no longer. And finally, the last question. How do we become more empathetic people? So I think the answer to that question is that we have to look into the Chumash and we have to see the person that embodied and personified Naisi Belem Chaveri. And that is none less than Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is chosen to be the leader of the people of Israel. He has what we would call today a very thin resume. He would never get the job today. He has only three things on his resume. Three things. Number one, the Pusik says, Meshra Benu could have remained ensconced in the palace. But rather than that, he goes out, my brothers are suffering, so am I. Empathy. Number two, he sees the Egyptian beating up the Jew. He kills the Egyptian. Vayaches HaMitzri. I don't have to get involved in this fight. What's Paro going to say if I go ahead and I kill an Egyptian? But he does it anyway. Because he cares for another Jew. 
And number three, when he sees the daughters of Yisro in Midian being accosted by the other shepherds, he comes to their rescue. People who he doesn't know, women who he doesn't know. But he sees another person suffering, he comes to their rescue. He embodies empathy. That's how he got the job. To be the leader of the people of Israel, you have to be empathetic and sympathetic and care. He's our paradigm. And how did he become that way? So Chaim Shmulevit says, he came that way because it says, Vaya'ar b'siv loisim, he looked at them. That's the first step to empathy. Look at the person. Look at their eyes. Look at their body language. Look how they're carrying themselves. Look at them. Observe. And then listen. And then listen to their tsaris. Any rabbi will tell you that when people come to them and they go ahead with their litany of tsaris, they usually don't have a magic book to solve the problem. But people come anyway. Because people appreciate somebody who listens. First you see, and then you listen, and then you employ another gift that God gave human beings. And that's what the Altaf and Kelim calls the Kayach Hatziur, the ability to imagine. And imagine what these people are going through. I looked at them, I heard them, and now I begin to think, what are they going through? And that kaya hatzibur, the ability to imagine, is the only way I can explain the following story. This story is an incredible story. And it's really incredible in the literal sense of the word. It's not credible. But I know it's true. Because the woman who's involved told it to me. And she's not a liar, as you'll soon, soon see. I met a woman in Switzerland this year. And she told me over the following story. And I said, this is so moving. Can you write it up for me and send it to me? And she wrote it up. And here's the story. Her husband and another man had a chance encounter. They shared a cab ride together. That is the extent of their relationship. And here is what she writes. They shared a car ride together. Both resulted, but it resulted in an everlasting soul connection. They were both Bali Tshuva. They were both Tamidi Chachomim scholars. Both had sound emuna in the hand of God but both were suffering from a dreaded disease, enduring difficult treatments. Then one man passed away, this man's, this woman's husband, leaving his widow with children of whom the youngest was 10. There were many financial obligations and the mother was trying to manage on all front. Friends were well-meaning organizations tried to help, but only one person stuck, stepped forward. This man calls her, and says to her, I'm your brother. And a brother helps a sister. He spoke directly, consider me your brother. A brother can take care of his sister's family. What are your biggest worries? I will take care of them. I can care of two, take care of two families. A brother steps in when his sister is in pain. Let's begin. What are your biggest worries? I can ease your burden. Take the heavy pack off your shoulders. It was a personal debt that her husband was paying off and she could not. She was overwhelmed by the responsibility. The debt was almost $30,000. But the brother did not rest and the brother paid off the debt. And then he says to her, let's carry on. What's your second debt? It was a huge overdraft from the bank threatening to repossess her home. 
Please understand that this man is not a millionaire. He's a father with obligation to his own married children. But a brother helps his sister. He told all of his own children that they have to tighten their belts because their sister, his sister, needs their money. My savings were never meant for me. Pensions are for my sister's family. He cashed in of his, all of his pension funds and gave it to her sister and saved her house. And now, two years later, a family who survived by the compassion of another family. I ask you, <clears throat> how did he do that? How does a stranger that barely knows the husband and doesn't really even know the wife, how does he do that? The only explanation I have, besides obviously having a big heart, is the kayachatsir, the ability to imagine. Because here's a man that's suffering from cancer himself. Here's a man that knows that his wife may become a widow very soon and knows that his wife will also have to deal with this tremendous burden. He saw this woman, he saw this man, he heard this woman, and he imagined. I, that may be a bridge too far for most of us, myself included. But here is something that all of us can do and should do. And when we walk out of here this morning, and what we think about over the next days of all, the 10 days of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I want us to think about this particular issue. We can all ask. When you see a person who's suffering, don't avoid the person. Don't look the other way, but ask him or her, how's it going? He's been unemployed for the last six months. Anything doing? Can I help? Any leads? Do you know someone that I may know someone that could help you? If their mother is sick in the hospital, don't avoid the person. If a person needs marriageable partners for his own children, ask. Anything doing? Can I help? Unemployment is not contagious. It's not going to happen to you if you ask. And don't delude yourselves by thinking, well, if I ask, it just makes it more painful. Trust me, it's on his mind 24-7. I met a man last week who, Rahman al lost a child. He got up from Shiva. He walked into shul, and a group of his friends were standing in shul schmoozing. And he walked by them, and no one said a word. They kept on talking. Can't you come over and say, how are you doing? And you can't, you don't know what the right words are? Give him a hug. Grab his shoulder. But show, at least I think about you. He was devastated. His words were, I just had a nuclear attack on myself. I lost a child. And my friends can't even say, how's it going? This past summer, a fellow died was a friend of mine, a name that I think most of you may know. His name is Mayor Zlotowicz. Mayor Zlotowicz is the founder and publisher of an institution called Art Scroll. 
I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who has an art school publication in their home. I should ask, is there anybody here who doesn't have an art school publication in their home? A Siddur, a Machser, a Gemara, a Chumish, a biography. Busy man. This past summer he died. He died on the Motsai Shabbos. The Levaya was Sunday. The Shiva began on Sunday. I went to be Menachem Oval to pay a Shiva call. The house was a mob scene, a line to get in. Thousands of people from all over the country came to be Menachem Oval because he was a famous man, a man that touched many, many, many lives. So Gedalia Zlotowicz, his oldest son, says that there's a fellow who came in and sat down in front of him and he had tears running down his cheeks. And it was obvious that the man wanted to say something. But it was too busy, there were too many people there. He couldn't talk. Gedalia said to him, come back tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, before davening, and tell me what's on your mind. And he comes back and he says to Gedalia, 15 years ago I lost my grandfather and I was angry at God. And I stopped putting on tefillin because I hated God. He says, your father would see me on the street in Flatbush and he would always say to me, hey, how's it going? You want to talk? Come over anytime, we'll talk. Let me hear what's going on in your life. Mary Slotens was a busy man, a powerful man, many demands on his life. And here's a very, very, very simple Jew on the streets of Flatbush who Mayor Zlatas occasionally runs into. And he says, how's it going? He tells Gedalia Zlatowicz, for the last three days, I've put on tefillin because of your father. Because your father said to me, how's it going? Didn't solve his problems didn't solve his theological problems, but showed he cared. And now he put on tefillin from one question. How's it going? Come by and schmooze. We're not able, all of us, to empty our pension funds, but we can always ask, how you doing? Goodbye. Very special thank you again for everyone coming, and we wish Rabbi Fran a safe trip and a safe trip.